I'm going to start this off by saying I was never the biggest Miles Morales fan. I thought he was a corny derivative imitation of the real Spider-Man, and is a prime example of how Marvel's trying to replace their most popular superheroes with characters who have zero interest in qualities on their own. For example, the only thing relevant about these characters is that they replace someone more interesting. But man do I fucking love Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse and I love Miles in it. It's one of the best superhero movies of all time. I'm not really a big fan of animated movies, but when the movie ended I was like, Miles is fucking awesome. It was a fun and interesting take on a superhero origin story. Miles became Spider-Man to honor Peter Parker's legacy and his dying request to stop Kingpin from destroying the universe. I couldn't wait to see where this story went. Which brings us to Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Miles has been Spider-Man for over a year now. He's been having trouble balancing his personal life with his secret identity as Spider-Man, which is causing problems with him at school and with his parents. He feels isolated and lonely and he misses his multiverse friends, mainly Gwen Stacy, because you can tell he was in love with her. When Gwen shows up again in Miles' world while pursuing a supervillain called The Spot, Miles decides to follow Gwen into the multiverse and meet the group that she's working with, the Spider Society. What the hell is the Spider Society, you ask? It's a group of Spider-Men and women from around the multiverse who work together to preserve the timeline. But Miles gets more than he bargained for when he meets Miguel O'Hara, aka Spider-Man 2099. He reveals that Miles become a Spider-Man in his world was an anomaly, and it caused damage to the multiverse. He also tells Miles that every Spider-Person has a canon that cannot be changed. It's a tragedy that makes them who they all are. Peter Parker loses his Uncle Ben, Miguel lost his family, Gwen lost the Peter Parker of her universe. To try and circumvent these tragedies means damage to the multiverse, which then leads to Miles figuring out that his father is going to be killed in a few days. He wants to travel back to his own universe to save his dad, but Miguel wants to keep him from going back to his own timeline so he won't damage the multiverse. At that point, chaos ensues. Let's get into what is awesome about this movie, which is damn near everything. I fucking love the animation for this series. Lord and Miller really created something different and unique. I also love how each universe has a different look, and when a character from one universe goes to another, the character keeps their original animation style. They've even got a Lego universe in the film. All of the returning voice cast are great, so I'm going to talk about some of the new cast. I loved Oscar Isaac as Miguel O'Hara, aka Spider-Man 2099. In a way, he's the antagonist of the story. It feels like you're supposed to root against him, but just as much as I like Miles, I can't help but understand where Miguel's coming from. He's trying to stop the multiverse from being destroyed. It's a complicated situation for Miguel to be in. He's a superhero who helps people. But in order to save the lives of many, he's got to let some people die. I love the way the character looks and moves. He fights like an animal in battle. When fighting, he practically gets on all fours and chases someone like a lion. It looks fucking cool. The Spot is the other antagonist in the movie. He's a scientist who received his powers during the first movie when Kingpin's particle collider exploded. The explosion of the collider causes his body to be infused with portals. And now he blames Miles for what happened to him and wants revenge. But he's this awkward neurotic villain who dreams of becoming Spider-Man's arch rival. He absorbs particle colliders from other universes to become stronger. It wasn't until the credits that I realized it was Jason Schwartzman voicing the character. He does a great job. If there's ever a live action version of the spot, then he needs to play him. Daniel Kaluuya plays Spider-Punk, who is a British punk rock version of Spider-Man. Picture Russell Brand if he was Spider-Man and you have got Spider-Punk. At first I found him to be kind of annoying, but the character actually grew on me pretty quickly. The story has plenty of cameos and easter eggs, and there's no way I caught all of them. You've got Donald Glover reprising his role from Spider-Man Homecoming, but now he's the Prowler and he's imprisoned by Spider Society. You've also got Miss Chen from the Venom movies. She shows up when the Spot accidentally takes a portal into the Venom universe. There are a couple Spider-Mans from previous animated shows, although I didn't see the Spider-Man from the 90s Fox animated series. Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield are in the movie, but it's stock footage from their own Spider-Man films. Maybe they'll make an actual appearance in the next film. There are a couple problems with the movie. I had issues with hearing dialogue during the beginning of the film. The opening has Gwen battling a variant of the Vulture and half the time I couldn't understand what she was saying due to the music of the movie being louder than whatever she was saying. I only noticed it during the beginning of the film, but I checked online and I saw other people complaining of the same thing. It's kind of ridiculous that the studio didn't realize this before the movie came out. Also, the movie is just too long. It's something that's becoming a problem more and more with movies in general. Movies only used to be over two hours if they really needed to be, if the story demanded it. Now it's a standard for every film. Across the Spider-Verse is 2 hours and 20 minutes long and it's only a part 1. You could easily cut out 30 minutes of this movie and it would run even smoother. The opening prologue with Gwen leaving our universe and joining Spider-Society is like 20 to 25 minutes long. The whole thing could have been cut in half easily. 
Hell, you could have started the movie with Miles and just had Gwen show up in his universe already a part of Miguel's team and it would have worked just as well. Miles is the main character and you don't see him until nearly half an hour into the movie. You could have also cut out Peter B. Parker from the film. He's at Spider Society when Miles arrives but he doesn't really do anything in the movie. He cracks a few jokes and chases his daughter around, but then goes back home to his own world after Miguel tries to capture Miles. It would have been better if they kept him out of the movie until the final scene when Gwen shows up to recruit him for her own team. The ending itself is abrupt. Miles tries to go back to his world to save his father, and he uses a device that can send you to different universes. It scans Miles' DNA and sends Miles to what he believes is his home world, but it's the wrong universe. The DNA from the spider that bit Miles was from a different universe. And because that spider wasn't there to bite that universe's Peter Parker, there's no Spider-Man in this world and it's a world of destruction. Miles gets to see firsthand the consequences of him becoming Spider-Man and how it literally ruined another world. The movie ends with Miles getting captured by this universe's version of the Prowler, who turns out to be the Miles Morales of that world. The end. I am so fucking ready for part 3, you don't even know it. If I had a pussy, it would be soaking wet right now. Lord and Miller are absolute geniuses. Into the Spider-Verse could have been a fluke, but Across the Spider-Verse shows that these filmmakers are making something special. Disney and Marvel should be trying to think of a way to steal them away from Sony right now. Across the Spider-Verse is telling a more interesting multiverse story than anything Kevin Feige at Marvel is doing. Other than John Wick Chapter 4, this is the most fun I've had watching a movie this year. I don't think The Flash or any other upcoming big blockbuster movie this summer has a chance of competing with this. If Lord and Miller don't screw up the third film, then the Spider-Verse trilogy might go down as one of the greatest superhero trilogies of all time. It certainly feels like it's already on its way. Go see Across the Spider-Verse.